Grace to you and peace from God our Creator and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I love baseball. I love the beach. Memorial Day weekend is a good time to do both. Now, it would be silly to try and play baseball on the beach. And in my mind, it's equally silly to try and bring the beach to a baseball game. By that, I refer to this Southern California phenomenon of bringing beach balls to a baseball game. <laughs> I don't understand it. I can't stand it. You go to a baseball game to see a baseball game. If you want to have recess and play with the bouncy ball, go out into the parking lot and do it. But it never fails that you go to the game and then there they are smacking the beach ball around. You can't bring a knife into the ballpark be illegal and would get me into a lot of trouble. But I always bring a nice pointy ballpoint pen <laughs> because I am the place where beach balls go to die. <laughs> if it reaches me, I will stab it. Much to the dismay and anger of all the people sitting around me. Now, last weekend, we went to the Dodger game up in L.A., the beach ball capital of Southern California. I counted no less than eight beach balls going around at the same time throughout the ballpark. There was one near us, and I was prepared. But it never reached me because it reached some fellow one section over who threw it to the ground and jumped on it until it popped. <laughs> and then while the crowd was all chanting, loser, loser, he stood up and said, you want to play with the beach ball here? And he hit it, and of course it went straight to the ground and just lay there. People tried to do the beach ball thing, but it doesn't work if it's deflated. You know, people try to do the Christian thing, and it doesn't work if they're deflated. This morning we speak about being filled with the Holy Spirit. We speak about what God is doing for us, what God wants to do for us, what God wants to do with us. Let's take a look at the context here. Everybody loves Christmas. I mean, even people who aren't Christian celebrate Christmas. They may not celebrate it as the birth of Jesus, but they celebrate Christmas. And a lot of people celebrate Easter. Again, in the same way, there are all sorts of non-Christian things that are part of the Easter celebration. But people celebrate Easter. I have not noticed out in town this past week anything that would indicate society was getting ready to celebrate Pentecost. It's a forgotten festival. Sadly, it's also forgotten within the church as well. It's almost as if Lutherans were afraid of Pentecost. And that's true for a number of reasons. So this morning, for a few minutes, we're going to make it kind of a teaching sermon. I want to take a look at Acts chapter 2, the Acts of the Apostles, the history of the early church, and take a look at what happened that Sunday morning. Certain faith groups speak about being baptized with the Holy Spirit, something that Jesus several times told his followers was happened to them. We can speak of it this morning as being fire baptized. Now the author of the Acts of the Apostles is the Apostle Luke, the same man who wrote the gospel we heard from last week. And he's writing to Theophilus, 
And he recorded in his gospel about the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. Now in his next version, his sequel, he talks about what came next. And it's significant that one of the first events that occurs is the Feast of the Pentecost. Now Pentecost was originally a Jewish festival and was celebrated 50 days after Passover. It was kind of a harvest festival and it was created to worship God by offering the first fruits of the harvest. So it's the beginning of the harvest season. The people want to give thanks that God has blessed them and they're offering in the temple their initial sacrifices and gifts to God. And it's called Pentecost because of the 50-day gap between that day and Passover. But over the years, it changed a little bit and became known as the festival associated with the giving of the law. And for that reason, people from all over the world would travel to Jerusalem to make an offering in the temple. And that's why it was that on this particular Sunday, as we heard in the first lesson, there were citizens from all over the world present in Jerusalem and able to hear Peter's message. Take a look at the first verse of the text. We see that the giving of the law was important for the people of Israel because it was part of their covenant relationship with God. God had established his relationship with the people through Abraham, but then it was through the giving of the law that he was able to define for them what his expectations were. <coughs> for those people then, the law was the sign of the covenant. But on Pentecost Sunday, those who were followers of Jesus received God's presence in their lives. So for us, Pentecost is signs of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And you see that in verses 2 through 4, which talk about some physical signs that took place on the day of Pentecost. In verse 2, we hear that it was a sound like the blowing of a mighty wind. There are times when I've been in my beloved New York City and been down in the subway tunnels waiting for a train to come through. And off in the distance, down in the tunnel, you hear a rumbling, which grows louder and louder as the train approaches the station. Now, New York City has both local trains and express trains. A local train stops at every station. The express train only at a select few. So if you are standing on the platform of a local station, you hear the sound of the train and you can feel the wind being pushed toward you. And then there is the whoosh as the train goes by. And it's almost like you're standing in a wind tunnel. That's what it was like for the early Christians in this upper room. There was the sound of a powerful wind. Now, people who live in Glen Avon know exactly what that sounds like and feels like. Because even down in Menifee, when the wind is quiet, Madeline and I know we're going to get phone calls from ADT telling us that one of the doors here has rattled loose and set off the burglar alarm. We'll ask if anybody is inside, and they'll say no, no motion sensors have been detected. Okay, then go ahead and disregard, is what we tell them. It was just the wind. But I know you've sat at home, and you've listened to the sound of the wind outside your windows. These apostles are gathered together, and they hear that sound. I'll bet it was terrifying. I'll bet they had no idea what it was like. 
I've only been through one tornado in my life, although I've witnessed Dorothy encounter hers many, many times. <laughs> I can only imagine what it's like for people in the Midwest, inside their homes, as the sound of the tornado approaches them. But along with the wind came fire. It was like a stream of fire coming into the room and then splitting off so that little tongues of flame appeared over the head of each one of them. Now when we talk about wind, we refer to it as God's Spirit. In fact, the Hebrew word ruach and the Greek word panoima can be translated equally as spirit or wind. The presence of the fire tells us that what happened that day, the wind they experienced, was not just a meteorological thing, but rather it was the power of God. Sometimes on Pentecost Sunday, the church will choose for us an Old Testament passage from the book of Ezekiel. If you're familiar with the story, Ezekiel is in this valley and scattered out in front of him are thousands of dry bones, all disconnected. And God speaks to him and tells him to command the bones to come together. And they do. And God asks him to command that flesh and muscle and tissue appear on these bones. Ezekiel so commands, and it happens. But then God asks a curious question. He says, O oh, man of God, can these bones live? And Ezekiel's reply is, you know, why are you asking me? God then commands Ezekiel to call the wind from the four corners of the earth. He does. And the wind comes and swirls around these dead, lifeless bodies and reanimates them. It's an image very much like the picture we get in the creation story, where God has a dead, lifeless man made of clay. He breathes his spirit into it, and it lives. Ezekiel here speaks not just to those dry bones, but to ours as well. It's the interesting thing about the church we complain a lot. I know I'll be at the Synod Assembly in a couple of weeks, and one of the things that I'm sure I will hear is a lament from congregations about how we're shrinking, and how our numbers are going down, and our resources are dwindling, and we don't understand why that's happening when those independent, non-denominational churches are booming. The uninformed might think and say, well, it's because they have that happy, clappy, rock band style of worship. And a lot of Lutherans have copied that. I've been in praise bands in different congregations. We sing some praise songs here. Once I even heard somebody tap a foot. <laughs> but I don't see people pouring in just because we play a praise chorus. And other denominations like ourselves have experienced the same thing. This isn't sister act, and the people are not going to come in off the street because they hear some jazzy music being played. And as a result, our congregations continue to shrink, dwindle, starve, and die. No. What separates us from these other churches is that they're willing to step out of their comfort zone. And they're willing to allow God's Spirit to touch them. I did a little research, and I learned that over the course of an average lifetime, a Lutheran will hear thousands of sermons and attend thousands of Bible study classes and participate in hundreds of work-related projects. 
and will bring, on average, over the course of a lifetime, five visitors to church with them. I'll say that again. Over the course of a lifetime, the average Lutheran will step out of his or her comfort zone and invite five people to church. In fact, in a recent survey, not one Lutheran was able to say that he or she led another person to Jesus through their personal testimony. You want to know why the mainline church is shrinking and dying? And those independents are booming and becoming mega churches? It's because they have no reluctance to go out and tell the Jesus story to other people. I've worshipped with several of those congregations, some here in this building. And I've heard the pastors say, we look forward to seeing you coming back next week, and why don't you bring an unsaved friend with you? Now, I know that terrifies people. The thought of speaking out and sharing your faith with someone who might ridicule you, mock you, disagree with you, or worst of all, ask you questions. <laughs> but it's God's spirit that inspires. If I could put my finger on one reason why we are not all we could be as a congregation or as a denomination, it's because we've been unwilling to open our hearts, flip the switch, and allow the Spirit to energize us. We are like that dead, lifeless beach ball that couldn't be bounced and shared with other people. I saw the guy try. He stood up and smacked it. It went about three feet, went straight down to the ground, because nobody wants to play with a dead, lifeless beach ball. Nobody wants to worship in a dead, lifeless church either. And we can sing all the praise choruses, and I can practice for 10 years, and finally figure out how to play Lift High the Cross, <laughs> without my fingers getting all arthritic on the guitar. It's not going to change anything. I can preach the most wonderful sermons you ever heard. It's not going to change anything. We can conduct powerful Bible studies. It's not going to change anything if it's just the same group of us worshiping and studying and listening and praying. We heard Jesus say last week, you shall be my witnesses throughout the region and to the uttermost parts of the earth. We are the outermost parts of the earth. But we're not reaching. We're not touching people. But we could. And it's my prayer this morning that even though I've told you nothing new, I will pray as I have prayed every Pentecost Sunday. In fact, every Sunday. That God's Spirit would be invited into this room to fill each and every one of our hearts. To touch our lives. To inspire us. Paul called the Spirit the teacher. Jesus called it the advocate. Someone who speaks on our behalf and explains to us what we need to know. All we have to do is ask. A smartphone here is a marvelous little gadget. There's all kinds of information I could learn. There's all sorts of things I can do with this device. But at the moment, I can't do any of it because it's turned off. I turn it on, however. The wonders of the universe open up before me. Is your battery turned off? 
Is your life closed off to what the Holy Spirit can do for you? Or are you willing to be a little risky, live a little dangerously, and see what God can do with you? May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We worship God with our offering.